I had somebody uh, send me a video this week of another minister several years ago who lost his voice. And uh, it was amazing how many speaking engagements he got after that. <laughs> but because of microphones, you can do it. But uh, it was very encouraging to me to listen to his story. Many of you ask me all the time, do you hurt? I do not hurt. And I'm starting to see, especially after watching that video, because that man, when he lost his voice, it, you know, as far as I know, he still lost it. But he had excruciating pain when he would talk. And I look at what God is doing in the middle of this, and I'm going, that is amazing to me that I don't have any pain. So within, within what God is doing, what I've noticed is there's always a blessing within whatever the ailment is. Are we looking for the blessing, right? I get these cough, coughing fits at night, and the way I combat them is I praise God with them. I just thank him for the fact that my body's coughing, trying to get rid of something. And I've noticed my oxygen goes down just before I start coughing, which means my coughing is trying to get it up. There's so many things that we can be aggravated by, but there's a blessing within it if we're just paying attention. So, okay, so. We are going to get into, what is it, Exodus chapter 31, yeah, and uh, there's a lot going on here, a lot going on. There's so much symbolism in Exodus to the New Testament narrative, uh, Moses is always a picture of Jesus. Always. And when you see, he's a picture of Jesus' grace. And he's a picture of Jesus' judgment. It's as if Moses is a picture in the, new, in the Gospels of the message of peace. And then in Revelation, He's the message of judgment, and Moses fulfills all of that, and we're going to see some of that tonight. I think it's 30, 31, yeah. <laughs> and I will try my best to cover the microphone if I cough. So, so anyway, Brian is going to read for us, and hopefully he'll read out of the NLT and not the King James. <laughs> but uh, let's pray real quick. Father, in the holy name of Jesus, you are so mighty. You are so just. And yet, you are so full of mercy. It is just crazy what you're doing in my life in the middle of what seems like a tragedy. The, the blessings that I receive daily through people encouraging me is, feels undeserved, yet miraculous, yet it's so Barnabas it's not even funny. And out of all the years you've used me to encourage others, I'm receiving that encouragement back. And it just goes to show when we plant seeds, they turn into plants that bear fruit. And Father, I just thank you for that. Father, I thank you for this group of people you call your bride. That you look at us affectionately 
regardless of what the devil is talking to us about. Father, I thank you for these people that represent a remnant of your church right here in Ardmore. Father, I thank you for our stories that are full of dysfunction and ridiculousness and then you bring in this transformation process that causes us to be looked at with favor. That is just fascinating to me. So Father, I thank you for our salvation in this room tonight. And if there's anybody in here that doesn't know you, <laughs> Father, I pray that you would make yourself known to them today. In Jesus' name, give us ears to hear, minds to understand, and hearts to receive your word. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Okay, chapter 31 is going to uh, finish building of the tabernacle, the, um, all of the utensils, all of the furniture, the Ark of the Covenant, the menorah, it's going to finish that picture, okay? But I want you to pay special attention to what God does to these two men in it, okay? So go ahead and read, Brian. Craftsman Bezalel and Aholiab. <laughs> then the Lord said to Moses, Look, I have specifically chosen Bezalel, son of Uri, grandson of her of the tribe of Judah. I have filled him with the Spirit of God, giving him great wisdom, ability, and expertise in all kinds of crafts. He is a master craftsman, expert in working with gold, silver, and bronze. He is skilled in engraving and mounting gemstones and in carving wood. He is a master at every craft. And I have personally appointed Aholiab, son of Ahisamach, of the tribe of Dan, to be his assistant. Moreover, I have been given special skill to all the gifted craftsmen so that he can make all the things I have commanded you to make. The tabernacle, the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark's cover, the place of atonement, all the furnishings of the tabernacle, the table and its utensils, the pure gold lampstand with all its accessories, the incense altar, the altar of burnt offering with all its utensils, the wash basin with its stand, the beautifully stitched garments, the sacred garments for Aaron the priest and the garments for his sons to wear as they minister as priests, the anointing oil, the fragrant incense for the holy place. The craftsman must make everything as I have commanded you. Okay, stop right there. So what do we see about Bezalel and Ahoyab? What do we see that God has done for them? Made them great craftsmen of all of the arts. How many of you have ever met somebody who's good at art? How many of you have ever met one of those people, and they're rare, are good at all the arts? It's it's ridiculous the level of craftsmanship that comes out of this person. I got a couple of guys I follow on YouTube that take slabs of trees and turn them into tables. And they use all this resin with all this color. Uh, one of them has even gone as far as to carve like horses running in water, sticking out of the table. It's a 10 foot long table, four foot wide. He's got blue resin and it flows over the end and goes down and the horses are running through the water and they're sticking out. So it's sculpture, it's the table, it's resin, which is its own monster to work with. And you look at that and you're just, so here's my point, who gives that gift. He has skilled these two men and their apprentices with this ability that's beyond what is natural. Plus, they're in the middle of the desert. 
doing this with crude instruments. Do you know, at the base of Mount Sinai, they've actually found in the stone there, they found grooves that are where they poured the silver rings. They found the carving in the sandstone there of half of the cherubim, which means they poured half, they poured the other half, then they welded them together, then they buffered them, and then they cleaned them up and shined them to where the whole top of the Ark of the Covenant looked like one piece. In the desert, they did this. And you see that and you're like, we have all of these materials. We have all of these uh, tools at our disposal now. And we think we're all that in a bag of chips. And you look backwards and you go, oh, their heart was so much better because it was so pure. And some of their ways of doing things were archaic, but they were better than what they do now. It was because it was a complete download from God, right? Now, what's interesting to me in this is this is a picture of the Holy Spirit after the resurrection. And the devil loves to tell you you're worthless. And the devil loves to tell you you can't do stuff and you'll never measure up. And God has already gifted you with a gift. We talked about it Sunday with your salvation. When the coming of the Holy Spirit comes on you, there's a gift that's attached to that that you don't have to work for. You don't have to do. It just flows out. That's a picture of Bezalel and Oliab. And then you got Noah. You know, do you know they found so much stuff of Noah's Ark that they actually say the craftsmanship is unparalleled. In fact, every ship that is built is built on the exact same measurements in adjusted rectangle. The exact same measurements. Isn't it, there's a perfect, there's a perfect uh, replica. The Ark of the Covenant is, is the perfect uh, measurement for. Yes, it's known, it's known as the, the perfect ratio. And it's the Ark of the Covenant. It's the table of showbread. It's the tabernacle itself. Architects call it the perfect ratio. Yeah, and people are drawn to it. Yes, simply because of its dimensions. How does that happen? God does that. God imprints that on your heart. So I wanted you to see these two guys and now we read across this story like, oh yeah, here's information. No, no, no. It's so much deeper than that. So when you see stuff like this, stop. Ask God. This is the way I do scripture when I study. Father, there's more here you want me to know. Show me what I need to know. And he'll tell me, he will literally tell me, Google this sentence yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. and up ups all this stuff and then you weed through it and you go oh my gosh but if you'd asked that question one word different you'd have got something totally different yeah. Yeah. why is he doing that because when we desire the things of God he will always answer that always Amen. right okay say the same thing. I was just saying that uh, it's easy to read over that they would have had to have some pretty extensive homemade looms and stuff out there for the quality of the clothing that's going to be representing priests and God and holiness. How do you how do you in the middle of the desert 
How do you make finely woven linen? You watch a spider. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna get real crude here. All of a sudden they got oriental. <laughs> so why? Why does this matter? Because God is involved in every part of this tabernacle on earth so that men, mankind, will know him. Okay, go ahead and read the next part. It's instructions very- for the Sabbath. The Lord then gave these instructions to Moses. Tell the people of Israel, be careful to keep my Sabbath day, for the Sabbath is a sign of the covenant between me and you from generation to generation. It is given so you may know that I am the Lord who makes you holy. Who makes you holy. Yes. You must keep the Sabbath day, for it is a holy day for you. Anyone who desecrates it must be put to death. Anyone who works on that day will be cut off from the community. You have six days each week for your ordinary work, but the seventh day must be a Sabbath day of complete rest, a holy day dedicated to the Lord. Anyone who works on the Sabbath must be put to death. The people of Israel must keep the Sabbath day by observing it from generation to generation. This is a covenant obligation for all time. It is a permanent sign of my covenant with the people of Israel. For in six days the Lord made the heaven and earth, but on the seventh day he stopped working and was refreshed. Awesome. Okay. So, when people come up to you as a New Testament Christian and say, you need to be keeping the Sabbath. How many of us have heard that? A lot of us. If you really want to get to know God, you need to keep the Sabbath. Let me ask you a question. Who did he write this to? The Israelites. He says, your people, two or three times, we are grafted in the vine, but we are not the vine. We are grafted into it. The vine is the Jews. We're grafted in to the inheritance of God, which is Jesus. But we are not the Jews. You never see Paul ever or Peter ever tell the New Testament Greeks to keep the Sabbath. That's not a coincidence. This is a sign of the covenant between God and the Jews. Yes. Now, and Jesus said the Sabbath was made for the people, not the Lord. I thought I may be quoting that not exactly right, but he basically saying that. He says, I'm Lord of the Sabbath. So what Jesus does when he comes along, he completes the Sabbath. Now, does that mean we're not supposed to have a day of rest? Of course we are. The reason Christians meet on the first day of the week, and I don't care how this falls through Catholicism, people will say this happens because the sun god Horus, uh, the Catholics adopted that and put that in. That's why it's S-U-N-D-A-Y. The disciples who were Jewish met on the Sabbath and they met on the first day of the week, the day the Lord rose, and they called it the Lord's Day. It's Sunday because it reminds us of the S-O-N, not the S-U-N. And when you stop and you listen to this rhetoric, it is trying to get you back under the law. But the minute you read Romans, what does Paul say? Or Hebrews, he says, why are you putting yourself back under the law? Nobody can survive it. If you're going to start keeping the Sabbath, then you've got to start sacrificing animals again. No, Jesus is the final sacrifice. And this is no disrespect to the Sabbath. I want you to understand the argument when people say that to you, because I've dealt with this my whole pastoral career. 
there's always somebody shows up. Oh, if you really want to get deeper with the Lord, start keeping the Sabbath. If I want to get deeper with the Lord, Jesus said, my Father is always working, and I am always working. And pray like this, our Father who art in heaven, holy be your name. That's the key to me worshiping. It's not the Sabbath. And when you read Colossians, Paul lays it to rest. He says, why are you trying to, to worship on certain Sabbath, keep certain feasts, blah, blah, blah. Jesus put the old covenant to rest. Now, we still need a day of rest. We still need a day that we worship the Lord our God. Some people, and by the way, if God was really act about this, about us working on the Sabbath, there would be a mass death. Yeah. <laughs> because he said they should be put to death. Yes. See, see what I mean? So here's the deal. What day of the week do we set aside to worship? I got a friend of mine that's a pastor of another church. I said, what day is your day off? He says, it's Tuesday. I said, what do you do on Tuesday? He said, I don't answer my phone. I don't leave the house. I play, I play praise and worship music all day long. And I read my Bible. That's his Sabbath. That's his worship day. That's his set apart. See, there's nothing wrong with the concept. But when we get hung up on the Sabbath, when we're Greeks, because basically if you look at us through the eyes of first century church, we're Greeks. So, did I make that abundantly clear? All right. I don't preach when we were kids, too. We never, we wasn't one once, or we're not married one. I know, I know. We were a blue law state. There was no convenience store up until uh, 72 and 7-Eleven opened. Remember that? 7-Eleven. All of a sudden they were open on Sunday. And what's interesting is when you look back, when did, when did our society start going downhill? <laughs> anyway, Okay, Brian, now we're going to get in to this area we knew was coming because no man is perfect, right? So here we go. This is going to get ugly pretty fast. All right. Okay, there's a little bit left on 31. Okay, sure that's fine. When the Lord finished speaking with Moses on Mount Sinai, he gave him the two stone tablets inscribed with the terms of the covenant, written by the finger of God. Wow. Wow. The gold calf. When the people saw how long it was taking Moses to come back down the mountain, they gathered around Aaron. Come on, they said, make us some gods who can lead us. We don't know what happened to this fellow Moses. Who brought us here from the land of Egypt? So Aaron said, take the gold rings from the ears of your wives and sons and daughters and bring them to me. All the people took the gold rings from their ears and brought them to Aaron. Then Aaron took the gold, melted it down, and molded it into the shape of a calf. When the people saw it, they exclaimed, O oh, Israel, these are the gods who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Aaron saw how excited the people were, so he built an altar in front of the calf. Then he announced, Tomorrow will be a festival to the Lord. The people got up early the next morning to sacrifice burnt offerings and peace offerings. After this, they celebrated in feasting and, with feasting and drinking, and they indulged in pagan revelry. The Lord said, told Moses, Quick, go down the mountain. Your people whom you brought from the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. How quickly they have turned away from the way I commanded them to live. They have melted down gold and made a calf, and they have bowed down and sacrificed to it. They are saying, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Then okay. the Lord... Stop there. Wait just a second. Go ahead and read 9. 9 and the... 10. Then the Lord said, I have seen how stubborn and rebellious these people are. 
Now leave me alone so my fierce anger can blaze against them and I will destroy them. Then I will make you Moses into a great nation. Okay. Wow. Wow. Okay, so Aaron. Now this is what you got to remember. You remember Aaron was invited up the mountain along with 72 elders. They all saw the presence of the Lord. Aaron gets the rap for this. But where are the 72 elders? I want you to see how quickly we can be manipulated to accept evil. Even Aaron, even the 72 elders. Why do we so quickly fall into that? I know as a younger Christian, there were times I stood for God. I mean, like a warrior, like David standing in front of Goliath. And a week later, some little something would come up and somebody would say something and I would not defend the Lord. What's happened? I'm not, I ain't got my spiritual gear on. Right? I'm not walking with the Lord the way I think I am. So anybody can fall into this. So even though Aaron gets the rap here, we're all Aaron from time to time. But did you notice that they want a calf? Now, in our culture, we go, what, what is that all about? Well, in the Egyptian culture, Let's see, in Egyptian culture, this is the god of Apis. He's also a Canaanite god, the god of fertility for Baal. Now what's interesting about this, and Apis is also a fertility god for the Egyptians, because let's not forget, Egypt touched Canaan. So when you stop and think about that, it wasn't Saudi Arabia back then. It was part of Egypt, went all the way to the Red Sea. Not, not, the, not the Suez Canal area, but the Gulf of Aqaba. You know how the Red Sea does this? All the way over to Mount Sinai was Egypt. So it touches Canaan. They have similar gods. They just call them by different names. Here they are in no man's land, in Midian. They're in between these two cultures. And they have them make a pagan symbol that represents Egypt and Canaan. And Canaan is fixing to be the promised land. And God's going to wipe these people out. So when you see this calf, it's not just a calf. It represents everything that's evil between these two major pagan nations. They make Aaron the priest. And they make Aaron the priest. And he seems to willingly do it. But we can do the same thing. Don't judge too quick. Because we can do the same thing. Now, because we have the Holy Spirit, and I want you to see this, Moses at this point as the Holy Spirit. It's kind of like the kings in Judah always had the Holy Spirit on them. Sometimes they didn't they didn't feel pressure from Aaron. I mean but, they, they but put the, pressure on him. Yes they did. Yes they did. They did put pressure on him. But but you're gonna see something in a minute because 73 men caved. And in a minute you're going to see one man go, oh no you don't. So it ain't about the number. It's about the position. It's very, very interesting. Now, did you notice that God says, your people, Moses. Now, the reason I bring this up is because Moses 
is fixed to turn that back on God and say, no, they're your people. Now you're going to see something with Moses and God that is unbelievable. It's the same way you and I, this side of the cross, can talk to God. Only back then there was one guy who talked to God that way, Moses. In other words, he was in relationship, and God didn't strike him dead when he asked a question. And God didn't strike him dead when Moses confronts God. What, what do you mean confront? Oh, yeah, he kind of calls him out. I think he did it gently, but he was being honest. God loves honesty. God ain't afraid of your honesty. Okay? Okay, continue. But Moses tried to pacify the Lord his God. Oh, Lord, he said, why are you so angry with your own people whom you brought from the land of Egypt with such great power and such a strong hand? Why let the Egyptians say their God rescued them with the evil intention of slaughtering them in the mountains and wiping them from the face of the earth? Turn away from your fierce anger. Change your mind about this terrible disaster you have threatened against your people. Remember your servants, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You bound yourself with an oath to them, saying, I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars of heaven, and I will give them all of this land that I have promised to your descendants, and they will possess it forever. So the Lord changed his mind about the terrible disaster he had threatened to bring on his people. Okay, stop right there. So we see something here. That's an anomaly in scripture. The Lord changed his mind. I read a uh, commentary on this about two weeks ago. And the theologian says, I don't believe God changed his mind. I believe this was a test for Moses. Because I think it's in Isaiah and in Psalms. It says God never changes his mind. Okay. Okay, so... If God never changes his mind, what is this? It looks like God is changing his mind. But do you notice God accuses Moses of these are his people. And Moses said, you made a covenant with your people. Why is this back and forth happening? And why is there no judgment on Moses? Because Moses is truly humble. But Moses knows he is banking on his relationship with God. That it's give and take. I'm going to do everything God says to do. But he allows me the grace to talk to him any way I need to. You know, there's times I've cried out to God in anger. There's times I've just been flat mad at God. There's times I was humble coming into God's presence because I was so ashamed of my actions. And then there's times I come boldly into the throne room and say, God, I declare this in the name of Jesus because I know your spirit is telling me to do that. So which one does God love? All of them. Why? Because that's relationship. Do you know? On a weekly basis, I have to apologize for Michelle to Michelle because I'm going through stuff and I'm processing it differently because I'm the one going through the physical side of it. And so I say things as I'm processing what's happening. I say things that can actually trigger her heart to go into grief. And as much as I love her, I just want her to be with me in it. But at the same time, even when she's with me, sometimes when I say certain things, it's grieving to her. Because there, there becomes this finality to it. You know, one of the reasons why Americans don't talk about death much is we don't like it when somebody has peace with it. Because I don't have peace with it. Why are they talking as if it's no big deal? I'm being saying that hypothetically. So, exactly. So, other cultures are not afraid of it at all. And they talk about it often. 
That's why they will prepare a body and leave it in a room for three days. Not think anything of it. It's in the kitchen table. For goodness sake. That happens all over the world. And they mourn. And then they let go. And see, our nation doesn't mourn well. Because we don't know how to let go of anything. We're possessive of everything. Right? But that's the crazy part. Yes, but that's the crazy part. If we're going to truly live wise, then we need to understand that death is part of life. You know, what? I was going to say, don't let the things of the world blind you. And if you do, then don't blame God when you can't see him. Exactly. So I'm watching the flowers in my front yard that Michelle planted this year. I'm watching them die. But you know what happens? Usually by the end of October, Michelle's out there scraping seeds. <laughs> What's going to happen next year? She's going to plant them. We're going to get to enjoy that plant next year. But it had to die to produce seeds so they could relive. And that's, that's what our lives are. In Christ, we got a whole nother level of understanding in that if we stop looking at death through fear it's crazy
Go ahead, 15. Then Moses turned and went down the mountain. He held in his hands the two stone tablets inscribed with the terms of the covenant. They were inscribed on both sides, front and back. These tablets were God's work. The words on them were written by God himself. When Joshua heard the boisterous noise of the people shouting below them, he exclaimed to Moses, It sounds like war in the camp. But Moses replied, No, it's not a shout of victory, nor the wailing of defeat. I hear the sound of celebration. Okay, stop. Now, why does Joshua say this now? Because Joshua's halfway down the mountain. Moses is halfway down the mountain. There's Joshua sitting there for 40 days and 40 nights also. And God is also fulfilling all of his needs. Joshua, in fact, it looks like is the one writing this part of Exodus. Remember, the book of Joshua comes after the first five books. Joshua's a good writer, and he's probably writing this from his perspective. Now, I love that. Moses goes, oh, no, that's not what this is. It's amazing what wisdom says. It's also amazing he just trusted what God said and added down the mountain. When they came near the camp, Moses saw the calf and the dancing, and he burned with anger. He threw the stone tablets to the ground, smashing them at the foot of the mountain. He took the calf they had made and burned it. Then he ground it into powder, threw it into the water, and forced the people to drink it. Stop. (laughs) One guy. One guy. You talk about David and Goliath. One guy. I can just see Moses. Now, at this point, he's about, what is he, 60? No, he's 40. He's probably 42 years old. 40 years. No, he's 82 years old. He's 82 years old. He probably looks like Gandalf the Grey, right? Probably with the same staff, with the eye of whatever on it. And he... And I think he comes down, and that calf, it looks like, was about this big. Probably about the same size as the Ark of the Covenant. And I think he comes down, he throws, now check this out, he throws down the covenant of God, written by God's own hand. And God never gets mad over that. It's because it's righteous anger. And even in the heat of it, Moses is transferring from what God's feelings are to himself, and he's smashing the covenant. Uh, This should be something that God would kill him over. God never mentions anything. But then as quickly as he smashes it, I think he takes that staff and he he hooks one of those legs of that calf and flips it on the ground and dumps the fire that's nearby, the coals on it, and the gold starts to melt. And he looks out at those 72 elders and Aaron and says, gather the people up. I mean, you talk about take charge and be large. Yeah. This, is, this is unbelievable. A million people are afraid of this one cat. He's probably glowing like the sun. Let's not forget that. They don't even know if he's human. He looks like the angel of the Lord. When when you can visualize that, and I don't think anybody's ever captured that on film, but I can see it in my head, and it's amazing. It's like, yes, sir, I'll drink the gold. Yes, sir, no problem. Put it in whatever liquid you want. Okay, keep going. Finally, he turned to Aaron and demanded, What did these people do to you to make you bring such terrible sin upon them? Don't get upset, my lord, Aaron replied. You yourself know how evil these people are. They said to me, Make us gods who will lead us. We don't know what happened to this fellow Moses who brought us here from the land of Egypt. So I told them, Whoever has gold jewelry, take it off. When they brought it to me, I simply threw it into the fire, and out came this calf. (laughs) You think you've come up with some pretty good excuses. 
<laughs> Moses saw that Aaron had let the people get completely out of control, much to the amusement of their enemies. There it is. So, so he stood at the entrance to the camp and shouted, All of you who are on the Lord's side, come here and join me. And all the Levites gathered around him. Moses said to them, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Each of you, take your swords and go back and forth from one end of the camp to the other. Kill everyone, even your brothers, friends, and neighbors. The Levites obeyed Moses' command, and about 3,000 people died that day. Go ahead. Then Moses told the Levites, Today you have ordained yourselves for the service of the Lord, for you obeyed him even though it meant killing your own sons and brothers. Today you have earned a blessing. Whoa, 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 whoa. Now, there's easily a million people there. He only kills 3,000 because these are the instigators. These are the ones who tempted everybody else. God does not put up with the tempters. And some of us have been tempters in our life. Let me tell you something. When you feel the weight of that during your salvation, it's humbling because you know he could have squashed you for that. I'm going to get into something Sunday, and I want you all to be here. And I don't know if it's going to last the whole service or not, but I'm going to talk a little bit of good and evil in the politics that are going on right now because this vote is coming up and this right here is a perfect example of what God will put up with and what God won't and when I introduce you to the scripture Sunday you're gonna you're gonna see why we need to vote a certain way and it's not because I like one candidate or I dislike the other candidate it's because America has come to this. We are right here. And God is willing and able to wipe out the blasphemousness for the sake of saving our nation. It's just something you got to think about. This is the most moral, moral, this is the most moral and immoral election of our times. Maybe from the inception of our country. Now, why does God honor the killing of people? This is the hardest part of understanding the Old Testament. God deals with evil differently than we do. He nips it in the bud, and especially with this one people group called the Israelites who are supposed to declare to the nations who God is. Yeah. And God, in all of his glory, is traveling with them. And everybody sees it. And so when the nations around there are glassing from the mountains and they see them start to kill one another and then they see the bodies piled up outside the camp and burned, they're going, oh, dang, we ain't messing with them if they'll do that to their own people. And they report back, those spies are reporting back and they're going, I don't know what happened, but something happened. Moses came down from the mountain. He broke some stones. He melted a calf. And he made them drink it. And then they killed 3,000 of their own people. So when you see that from the outside perspective looking in, it's like, what is going on? Now you begin to understand why they had such respect in the next 40 years. There's a couple of countries disrespect them. God deals with them quick and it ain't pretty but that's the way that God deals with evil check this out without Jesus as the filter 
people always say to me, if God is so good, then why does he allow evil? I say, because we're in the age of grace. What does that mean? That means God is having grace on you. Do you know you're actually evil and you don't know it? And yet, the sun comes up every day for you. The air comes up every day, or on every day, for you. You get water to drink every day. Grace. Unmerited favor. And he's extending it to you. See, we have this responsibility to warn people. And this was the first warning to the children of Israel. God wasn't going to put up with this kind of nonsense. They just agreed to a covenant. Forty days ago, we agree with everything you said. What happened? People are fickle. People are fickle. All right, let's pray, and we'll go. Brian, would you pray over us too? Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for today. I thank you for your grace and forgiveness that we've experienced. Uh, I thank you for this fine lesson. And I allow, allow you, ask us to uh, allow you to meditate on it throughout the week and uh, prepare our hearts for the message Sunday, knowing the stakes that are to come. Um, be with those we care about, Lord, that uh, have not come to you and give us the courage to speak to them. Uh, give us the courage to speak to the stranger just to double check that they know you, Lord, for any time is a good excuse to talk about you. Uh, all these things I ask in Jesus' name. Amen.